Hi, my name is Kip Kater, and welcome to the Creatives Garage Masterclass. Today we'll be speaking about the gig economy, the freelance economy, and uh, different versions of how this works and different versions of how this happens. I'm going to speak about methods strategies and, and uh, creative directions of how you can start yourself into this process, but also we're going to talk about a few examples of what I've experienced and possibly the future of where this is all going, in the, um, yeah, the future of where all this is going. Um, when it comes to the gig economy, let's break it down in terms of what this thing actually is. Have you ever ordered an Uber or have you ever ordered food from a takeaway space, uh, takeout space. Um, in most cases, if you've done any of these two things, you've participated in this economy. Um, in essence, what this economy actually means is that it's, it's, it's a way in which two people are connecting via a platform to exchange goods and services for economic benefit. So I, as a photographer, takes a picture and send you the picture, and in return, you send me money for my services in the simplest form. Um, but now, in the early years, it used to be just about the apps, the ride-hailing app, apps, the, the food delivery apps, but now it's expanded to a whole different category of multiple things. You can literally freelance on pretty much every subject you could think about. This is from law to, to music writing to business strategies, you could be a freelancer for any of these things. Basically, whatever skill that you have within yourself that you're ready to share or ready to compact into a lesson or compact into a product can literally be given back as a service to, to somebody else as part of the gig economy. There are two ways in which you can, there are a few ways you can participate in this, but I'll suggest two ways. Um, the first way, would be to figure out a skill or figure out a, a, an anchor of a service of which you're ready to share. It doesn't have to be something that you're doing full time, it just has to be something that you're decent at. So people can connect to you in a simple format because you need to be able to produce something that's of decent standard. Um, where I come through with this is that I participate in this economy every day. I have been doing this for 12 years and with numerous examples in between them, um, mainly between photography, film, music, and music event management and strategy. And as I've, I've never really been able to take up a job in terms of a full time, because it's never been my temperament. And that's one thing you should also look at yourself. If you're not somebody who likes to do uh, full time work, it's easier to then to have multiple gigs. Multiple gigs that might be a little bit hard to manage, but as, you, as you've come to find, or as I've come to find in the most recent years, it's actually even easier to accomplish because you're accomplishing, accomplishing small pockets of, of actual work rather than the full scope of work. The full scope of work might be possible, but it's challenging. You need a whole crew, you need a whole line of equipment, you need a whole line of of, uh, of communication with a client and it becomes uh, not just a two month thing, but a six month thing, but an eight month thing. While if you're just doing a gig economy, you could just slim it down to a month or three weeks or two weeks or one week or one day. Um, the best way I'd even think for you to say it is think about a DJ. A DJ comes into a club, he does his gig and he's out. He does, not, he does not own anything in the club. He does not even own the decks that are playing in the club. For him, he's coming to showcase his, his music and to provide the experience to the audience. He is part of a gig economy. He's not 
he's not hired by anybody to sit in that club day in, day out like a manager or like the bartender or like the bouncer or like the, ma- or like the owner of the space. He is an individual who's coming in to provide his services. Um, the best way I'll say, the second way I'll say for, uh, the second thing I'll say that people need to be able to put together is that you have your creative product, your creative service. Now you must be able to have a rate card that lines up with it. This rate card is probably the most important thing that you'd have to look at because this rate card is not just going to be a standalone thing that happens once. It's something that evolves every six months. Why I say every six months is because every six months you've learned something new. You've learned a new way how to do something and you now have to push your rate into a higher perspective. Uh, I like to call it um, moving yourself from being an artist to being a professional so that when you are a professional, people call you according to your skill and level, which means you get higher pay, which means you get higher rewards for your work. Being an artist is excellent, or being an artist is not a consistent, viable, understanding thing. You have to, you have to get um, inspiration to be able to create art. You have to get into a zone where you have to create this thing for the, for the public. But if you don't, um, um, how are you going to get a client? So there are very many painters, there are very many sculptors, there are very many woodwork people, metalwork people, but are they professional or are they artists? This is the question you always have to ask yourself. Uh, when you look at an Uber driver, you could call him a professional. Why? Because as soon as he clicks that button and he says, I'm ready to come and pick you up, he's there to pick you up. It's not a question of... What is he doing? How is his mood? Where is he at? How did he sleep last night? He's on the job, he's on the clock, he's doing his work. And these are the two things that I want us to keep focused on as we have this conversation throughout this, throughout this, uh, throughout this viewing. There's two things that, um, that I want to bring up especially um, around, around the creative industry. If it's possible, most, most creatives like to think about it from a perspective of, I need to have a company, I need to have a crew. When you are a freelance or a gig worker, the less equipment you have, it doesn't mean that you're less professional. It just means that you have a different way of viewing the world. And the best way I can express this is when you look at social media. There's people who have the cleanest, cleanest, freshest, newest thing, but there's people who are completely authentic about what they do. So your expression is not really in terms of the depth of your skill. Your expression is really in terms of how you tell the story. How you tell the story is more important than how you look or how you feel. The story comes out through everything. The story actually connects you now to the businesses that you need. The story now connects you now to the, to the, to the business partners that you need, to the, to the camera people that you need, to the, to, the, to the artists that you're actually going to connect to create really good experiences. Uh, I like to look at this from, from a perspective of if we, can, if we can learn how to tell our stories better, we'll easily be able to identify the story that we should be telling people and we'll be able to tell that story with the proper confidence that we need. So the next thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the way this actually works for you to be able to create an income from it. Um, A few methods, a few strategies and a few directives of what you can do as as a creative but also what you can do as an individual freelancer to be able to create an income from this uh, from this economy. The best way I would look at it is if you are if you are if you are hired for a project and you have this photography project your client needs about 25 professional cleaned up shots and they need it to they need you to deliver within a week. Um, how you decide to have that communication is very important. The communication aspect of you talking to your client is is the reason why they'll work with you again. Your story, like we talked about before, is gonna bring them into into focus of, I want to work with this person. How you articulate your story on social media or wherever you're using, be it a website or posters or billboards or paintings, it doesn't matter. But once they see that and they're, they're, they're connected to your story, 
the next level of what they they need is to be able to now have a clear communicative aspect with you. They want to be able to speak with you about what they need and know that you can articulate what they need. If you can't have that communication, and maybe that's the hardest thing to learn, it becomes a difficult, um, how do you say, a difficult working relationship. These working relationships are really the core of how everything works. It's the core of how you will be able to go on a date with somebody. You must be able to communicate your intentions. You must be able to communicate why you are here in the first place. You must be able to communicate what the person has said back to them and revert it in terms of your own words. So whenever I speak to a client, I listen to what they're saying. I listen to their story, I listen to the aspects of what they're talking about, and I take these things down in bullet points. After I do that, I reread them by asking the questions. And I use words like, so this is what you mean. And then I state their points. When I do that, I'm going back and forth with the clients just to make sure that I've talked about what they're talking about and we are framing everything in terms of what they need. It's like they have their call sheet and I have my call sheet and they should match. If they match, then great, we can have a great shoot. Does that mean, because that means we have all the elements in line that can be able to create this story that we're creating. Um, yeah, without this communication, I mean, who knows what you're going to be able to shoot? Who knows what's going to happen? And then everything becomes a post-production issue. And that's the one thing you want to try and avoid. Be it film, be it music, be it strategy, be it business, be it a website. You could name any of these gig-centric businesses that we're talking about. You must be able to articulate the story and the questions back to your client. The second, the second space in how, you, in how you are going to be able to gain income from this business is that you need to be able to figure out, with, with your rate card, you need to figure out how this rate card is going to evolve over the next five years. What do you need to learn to be able to move yourself up the levels of what is your creative inspiration? If you're a filmmaker and you're using a small camera, do you have a plan within five years that you're going to use a bigger camera? Do you have a plan to be able to have a crew to support you? Do you have a, do you have a plan to, to be able to structure a new way of making films? Um, there's one person who, I can, who comes to mind. Uh, she did not have any funding uh, for a movie. She had about, I think, less than, less than $5,000 to shoot a movie. So she decided to create a Zoom movie, a movie that was presented, everything was presented on Zoom. So it was just about background setting and Zoom. But this thing has taken off, it's been shown in different film festivals, different, different theaters, different businesses want to now license it. And that it's created a whole new energy around, this is a new way of filming. It's not the ordinary two camera, three camera movie setting. It's changed, it's changed the aspect of what you can do in terms of filming. Why? Because of being creative. Seeing what you have and redeveloping a style around it. And once you start to do these kind of things, you start to realize that actually the only, the only rules that are there is that I must be able to tell the story still. But I can break every other rule around that. People, have, people are doing it with social media, with stories. We're doing it with reels. We're doing it with all, all sorts of tools. We're doing it with our phones. We don't even need cameras. We're doing it with our phones now. So... How are you going to take that storytelling to the next level? Is this is this point? How what is the what is the new space that you want to enter into that perhaps you have not tried? Um, myself, I started off as a a nature photographer. I was taking pictures of um, of holidays that I was going to, or spaces that I was going to, um, with people that I was connecting with, and it started to shift from just nature and the aspect of nature to going more into being people and portraits. And now I'm very much into taking full-on portraits for people. I want to be able to focus on capturing human essence within a picture. I want to be able to see how I can tell people, I can tell somebody's look from a picture, but tell, but tell it from my perspective. And it's changing how I view Photography. I used to be I want to do it outside, and now I want to do more in studio photography with lights and different angles and different backgrounds, and even different mediums. Maybe people jumping in a pool, and you want to take a picture of that. So my level of photography has now changed from 
nature and capturing what is there at that time and moment with natural light into more studio clean and finesse photography. And I want to go all the way to, let's do magazine covers. Let's do portraiture covers for, for big, big celebrities. Let's do fine art paintings and layer them with, with sound and picture and see what can happen. I want to see if I can do NFTs around that situation. But, it all t- but it's all more of a direction that I want to take. After speaking about communication, now it's time to speak about networking. When it comes to networking, you have to think about it from two perspectives. Um, One, what are you capable of doing? And two, who are the people around you? When when I started as as a photographer, I wasn't sure about a lot of things. So everything was just practice or... How do you say it was? It was looking at what I could do, seeing it, seeing it happen, and looking at what other people are doing, and then comparing. But as I came to grow in my craft, which is mostly photography and film, I realized that there's some things actually I, I do not know how to do. I do not know how to create certain images, or I do not know how to edit, or I don't know how to where to get the cameras from, or perhaps even having different angles of how you want to manage your your viewing. What happened to me when I started realizing maybe I should hire other people or maybe I should find other people to do this work, it made me expand the vision of what I needed to create. Um, with this in mind, it's, also, it's good to think about that when it comes to this, this segment of the economy. Because when you look at it, we started from ride hailing and takeaway services, but now you could literally freelance every single piece of work that you have. Um, we've talked about all of them, lawyers to artists all the way through. If you understand that you could freelance everything, then you could come from this freelancing question from different points. Do you have to be the creative or could you be the manager? Or could you be the service provider? Or could you be the equipment holder? Could you be the person who connects all three or four of these people into one space and manage them? The main thing I like to think about when it comes to networking is that when you realize your strengths, you could realize that you could up-level your strengths or that you could actually support it with an anchor, be it uh, a creative partner or new equipment or a new way of framing things. Um, when I was, uh, I'll give you an example from where I sit. I was part of this festival, I'm part of this festival called Cliffy New Year. And right now we like to create um, three-day festivals for for Kenya, it happens towards December, and it's a, it's a 12-day setup with a three-day festival. What we like to do in this space is have full-on experiences. Myself, I like to participate as a photographer, but I'm not the best photographer. So somebody else comes in, line for me to do that. I maybe direct them about what they need to do, and they actually, do the, they actually shoot and they take the edits and they follow my art direction in terms of what they need. But in this festival, what happened is that I came in as a photographer, but slowly I started to learn the inner workings of how this business was, of how this business is actually structured. And slowly by slowly, I started shifting from photography and camera work all the way to lighting and stage. I realized that with my background, it was easier for me to manage people within that aspect than it was to build these things, to build the sets, or to learn how to edit lights, to learn how to edit frames and lights in the backgrounds and the backdrops and the, and the different waves you can create in terms of the stage. For me, the management aspect of things started to work out much easier because I had my communication intact and I had my rate card and understanding of what that meant intact. So even right now, I feel I look at myself more as a manager that I do as a creative. I've switched from being an artist to that kind of professional, where I understand the art enough to be able to manage people to take them into the spaces they need to go. Now, you could do this for any kind of um, industry or any kind of business you're talking about. Um, I was speaking earlier with, uh, with a friend, and he, he was talking about a festival and how different people have different aspects in which they create the festival. You don't have to be, you could be the driver of this festival, but you are hired literally for this gig to do this gig. And 
that type of leverage changes the whole reason of how you'd create this business. Because you realize that it's open to everyone. What happens is that your opportunity is going to help you decide the direction of where you actually want to go. When it comes to seeing how, how to develop this, it really focuses on your strengths. What are you actually good at? The networking builds up the, the base of your client base and the strengths build up how this thing is actually going to take place. When you're networking, you need to look at it, you need to look at it from how many people can I speak to and how many people are going to convert into buying what I'm actually selling. When, when, you're, selling, when you're selling a product and service, what happens is that there's a, there's a rotation of clock. There's a, there's a time that you meet this potential client, the conversation that you have with them, the space in between where they're thinking about you and your service to the time when they actually take it on. And this stretches from one week to six months. It depends on who you're talking to or what clients you're actually coming to, to network with. But it's an ongoing process. You always have to be out there. And not necessarily just on social spaces, but in terms of physical spaces, meeting these people, understanding what they want, and understanding what they need, understanding what they're looking at and seeing the different spaces of what they want to achieve, the different things that they want to want to articulate for themselves. If you see, if you see from that perspective, you start to realize that you can come in from any door, but you have to pick a door. But you can come in from any door. And that and what you what happens is that you become a service provider more than necessarily the artist. Because the artist is on stage, but so is the lights, so is the sound, so is the DJ, so is the MC, so is the back end manager, so is the artist manager, so is the booking crew, so is the advertising and sponsors. There's so many angles in which a gig is set up from. If you decide to pick which angle you connect with, you start to realize that even me as a professional be it in law or business or strategy, can actually come in and say, I'm going to start from the beginning, I'm going to start from the middle or from the end, and construct this whole new lifestyle of yourself. The lifestyle is really what you have to focus on, and it builds up momentum into what you want to create. The next level of, of business is actually going to come from the gig economy. As we become more self self-efficient and less, and less tied down to a job or less tied down to a narrative, we start to realize that we can actually do what we want to do, we, but we just have to reframe it. Um, I want to talk about now how we are shifting from, from the simple aspect of, what, of, of, of goods and service exchange to what we're actually going to grow up to and come up to in the future. The next space we're going to talk about is the development of where the, the gig economy is going to. Um, from we've talked about where it started, now we're going to talk about the two, the middle section of where we are right now, and the future of where we're actually going to. The beginning of this, the beginning of this whole story started with the uh, beginning of the web. People were deciding to put their profiles up, having a web 1.0 profile, which is just showcasing who you are and contact details. That's web 1.0. Sharing your story, but not really allowing people to give feedback. It's more about buying the service. Where we are now is a space where we have connected industries, where we're seeing that social media is allowing us to connect. Social media and social media apps and technology apps are allowing us to connect in a whole different way. Where we're seeing that we can communicate with each other without any middle person coming in the way. So me as my service, I put it up. And as I put it up, I have, my, I have different ways in which people can reach me or different ways people can communicate with me or back and forth conversation that you can have with people. Where we're going to now is that a lot of everything that we're creating is going to be created for the purpose of locking it into a, a profit-making system where that each piece of content that's created each piece of narrative that's created is actually going to have a, an agreement around it that feels like a share agreement. It feels like you're doing, it feels like, a, it feels like you could possibly sell not just the one piece of content, but keep selling that one piece of content 
continuously. So when I look at it, it's it's uh, it's a little it's Web 2.0, but it's the added value of having an income stream that's connected to it. So having a, a digital wallet that's connected to your to your profile or connected to your platform. We see a little bit of this when you look at things like Patreon or what YouTube is doing right now when it says join YouTube and subscribe. But you're not just subscribing; you're subscribing with a pay with a payment portal inside it, because you want to get more back-end information. This, this connected space, connecting it to money, is where we're actually all going, because it's going to now start enabling us to now move a lot faster, number one. We also allow the things that we create to be bought by anybody. What this means is that you could, you're, you're, the person who you're targeting might not even be in Kenya. The person you're targeting might not even be in Africa. The person who might really pick your interests or pick the interest of what you've created is actually somebody who's just like you. Somebody who's grown up with the same circumstances, doesn't matter where they are in the world, but where they feel that this is actually more, it fits who they are and fits who they can be. And as we start shifting into this space, it creates a whole new level of now possibilities because uh, I'll give you one great example. Uh, NFTs are a complicated conversation. I won't even get into it. I'll just, I'll just slightly jump on top of it. But what an NFT allows you to do is that it, it, it allows you to share your content with the people who most appreciate it. So if you had 100% of your album finished, you could give off 20% of that album to the closest people in your community. And those people could actually end up earning more money from it because they're the first investors within that 20% bracket. They can now start buying into your product in a, in a whole different way. They start to see that your product is actually an investment. It's not just a product or a service. It's a proper investment. It's a tangible, it's become a tangible good, non-tangible but tangible good that now stretches beyond the time that it's actually being made. You can resell that like art, you can resell that like a car, you can resell it like a, a piece of property. This is where we're actually stepping into. Because anything that you create as your service becomes now part of an ecosystem that people can continuously buy. It's almost like buying a, it's almost like doing an online class. That class doesn't disappear. That class is always online and you can always go back to it. But it's not only for you, it's for anybody who's interested in it. They can jump into it at any point in time and receive remuneration from it by that one-time creation. So the one-time things that we're creating now are becoming staples, are becoming things that you could always come back to and you can always gain from. And what this is enabling the gig economy to do is that if you have whatever service or product that you're providing for people, you could literally make it a long-term profit. You don't have to keep it into one space. Um, when this happens, you, I mean, the opportunities are endless. You could do contracts, you could do music, you could do, you could, you could license, you could license you can license the digi how you digitally put your lights up for a festival and license that to every single festival holder so that they could use your style within what they're doing in the event. The whole thing has just opened up completely. So the different levels of which you're trying to meet in terms of how do I get this income changes. Because now you're not looking at it from one gig to the next gig. You're looking at it from these are the collective gigs that I've done. And these are the collective gigs that are continuously bringing me income. It's very, it's, cha it's changing the whole aspect of how we do, of how we create. There, there is um, this one point I would do want to stress though. And it goes back to the story. If you don't have a story, if you don't have an anchor, then this would not work. You have to have an anchor. You have to have a way in which this participation makes sense for you. When, when a cab driver decides that he's going to pick you up, he's picking you up because he's been, he's been hailed by you. It doesn't matter if he's slept, doesn't matter if he's awake, doesn't matter if he's had a bad night, he's there and he's doing his job. So how well you do your job is how it will literally convert and say, this is how much profit you're going to get from your job. It changes the whole 
the whole reason. And that way, the whole competition now starts. Everybody is now jostling for that same position. But as we expand, there'll be more positions. But right now, everyone is just jostling for that position. So I started my journey as a creative producer, not really knowing what I was doing, but making music productions, making uh, DJ sets, just doing random things onwards for just my own pleasure and for my friends or for my community. But slowly as I've learned how to do this, I realized that my position in life is not really about being the artist necessarily, but it's about being somebody who can inspire the artist, someone who can be able to lead the artist to a different direction. Um, but I call everyone an artist. I call even people who create really interesting um, necklaces or chains artists. I call people who create amazing jams and chefs artists. I, I look at it from art being what you are actually giving to the world. And I've realized that my role is not necessarily in creating the art, but it's in helping the people figure out how they're going to create their art. I want to see how we can all develop this this understanding for ourselves so that we can be able to pick the positions that we want in life. And how I do that is by being a manager. What I want to express to you all is that if you can really see yourself in the full picture of who yourself is, you start to realize that your dreams are only as limited as what you're actually feeling or what you're actually thinking about. The thoughts that you put into your work is how you will develop this new space of which you have to go to. But always remember, there's always a new space. It's not today, it's not tomorrow, but it's always coming. One thing I'll leave you guys with is that think about your journey as a 10-year journey. Don't think about it in terms of year or six months or what I'm doing next week or what I'm doing in three months. Think about it in terms of 10 years. What do I want to achieve in 10 years? Where do I want to be? Where do I see myself in 10 years? Even if it doesn't exist at that point in time. But what could I do? It could be, it could be Grammys, it could be fashion shows, it could be traveling overseas, it could be living in some other new space, but all these things are accessible to us. What matters is how you're going to achieve it. Who are the people around you and who are achieving it and how you're going to do it. Your, how you're going to carry yourself in terms of your rates, how you're going to communicate with people, how you're going to network with them to believe in your dream. Because how you set yourself up is why it's going to work. Thank you.